So just ask yourself, are you broken and, and ready for, a, you know, just, just a breath of fresh air from the Lord? Yes. Or are you so churched that you're just, it's almost like an angry person. You know, you just say, talk to them, and they're just mm, stubborn, yeah, all right, you know. Or you say, you're this, oh, I'm this, I'm this, I've been following Jesus for so long, and as soon as something goes wrong, you're cussing every four-letter word you know. Amen. What comes out of you, you know, it's, it's hard to tell what kind of tree it is until you see the fruit. Oh, come on, come on, that's good preaching there. So I just want you to understand that. If there's, some, and listen, please, no condemnation, no, this is not to make you feel guilty, if that stuff is, if that is inside of you, that's poison. It has to come out. Let's uproot it. Let's get that poison out. And let's fill that stuff with that, all the good stuff that comes with a relationship with Jesus. You know, our countenance should be happy, cheerful, joyful. All the fruits of the Spirit, right? If someone looks at you like, man, you know, sorry. Excuse me, I'm going to open this door. You know, if you're afraid, you know, come on. Like, Yeah. You make a mistake, oh, no, let's do it right this time. Let's get it right. Amen. And please hear me. There's a time for correction. Yes. Yes. But that's just what love is, correction and compassion. Amen. Amen. So let me, let me do this real quick. This is an interactive place, by the way. You're not just supposed to sit back, fall asleep for some of you. <laughs> this is interactive. So I'm going to do something interactive real quick. Darren, would you stand up, please? William? Billy, would you mind standing up just for a second? Tom, would you mind just for a second? Let's see who else. Mark, would you stand up just for a second? Michael Banning, would you stand up just for a second? If you can. Okay, so, represent. Okay. Use your imagination here. Let's say that there are 12 guys standing up here just randomly picked, right? Which disciple are you? Out of the 12. Which one are you? Which personality traits do you have? Are you the one that needs to go and be heard? Are you the one that needs to be seen? Are you the, are you the one taking care of the money? Are you the one that wants to call fire down from heaven and just destroy those people? <laughs> All of you aren't supposed to raise your hands. So. <laughs> okay, you guys be seated. What I'm saying is randomly, let's just pick 12 people and say, which disciple are you? Can you accept correction? If you're following someone, if you're following a teacher, the rabbi, the master, if you're following them and they're saying, hey, you know, just out of love, I want you to know. This is an area you need to work on. <sighs> I'm just going to sit over here and play these drums. No, you know what I'm saying? You have to be open. You have to be willing to learn. You have to be able to walk the walk, to follow the path. And say, you know what? I guess I do need some work in that area. Yes, I do see it. And it's usually later on that night, laying in bed, two in the morning. Yeah, that's me. Now, would you have admitted it in front of everyone else in the room? No. And that's an area that needs to be worked on. Because leading is being transparent enough to say, hey, listen, I'm not good in this area, but you are. I need help. That's important. So Jesus went out and selected 12 men. I mean, have you ever really thought about that? Just 12 guys. And I know that he's, you know, God. But he went out and selected these 12 average, everyday kind of guys. And what were they doing? Average, everyday kind of things. That's what they were doing. And he said, follow me. And you know what they did? They dropped their nets. Or their tax papers. Or whatever it was they were doing. You know, they left everything that they loved. Everything that was familiar to them. Now, I want you to think about that. How many of you right now, if God called you right now, you heard that voice, or He walked in like He did me, would He, if He said that to you, how many of you would leave being a housewife where you're so comfortable right now? 
to do what he's asking. Ah, I couldn't watch the view every day. <laughs> you know, you you have your office, you have it running like clockwork now. It's finally in order. And he's like, I want you to come do this. How many of you would do that? And I'm not, you know, it's a rhetorical question, kind of. I just want you to understand, when that call comes, you know, and, and how many of you said, I'll do anything you say, Lord. Anywhere you want me to, I can go to a, a grass hut in Africa. <laughs> I just remember saying that before, you know what I mean? And I was like, you know, got, <laughs> but uh, I just, I mean, really. And that's, that is the point it took for me and Rebecca. We got on our faces and said, Lord, whatever it is, we went through some hard times after that. We did what the Lord asked. I mean, and <laughs> the way it worked out was so weird and hard and difficult. And people that you trust and people that know the word and people that just come against you out of nowhere and say things, say lies about you and, don't, and, and just, you know, and speak. It is the hardest thing in the world to let the Lord defend you when people are saying bad things and lies about you. But you have to let him do that. The battle belongs to the Lord. Otherwise, we dig in deeper. And we keep digging in that trench until we're looking up and we are so deep in that trench. It's just like there is no daylight around us. That's where we have to get back to the Lord and have to stand on that word. And these 12 that Jesus picked followed him. And they saw some amazing stuff. And they saw some very interesting people in the process. For those of you that have read the Bible, or do read it, look at the stories. Look at the people they came across. Look at the incidents that happened when they were following him. And these were just everyday people, average everyday people, that chose to follow him. Now, I'm a firm believer that they had a choice. And they could have made that decision. Right, Tony? They could have said, no, I like my fishing business. It's lucrative right now. I've got the best nets on the market. I've got a, I'm in contract talks for the next show on cable television for how to fish. Think about that. For that date and that time, they might have been the ones. You know what I mean? But they left and they followed him. And what they slowly began to notice was that their priorities began to change. The more they followed him, that life kind of just started to slowly disappear as they transitioned into what he had called them to do. And he's so smart about that. He won't drop something on your lap that's going to get you killed. He's not going to drop $50 million in your lap if you're used to $3,000 a month. Yeah, come on. And I really believe it's not God that'll do that. And he's not going to drop a ministry in your lap that you have no reason to be in or that you're not prepared for. Come on. Amen. Everything in the kingdom is seed, time, and harvest. Seed, time, and harvest. Because he loves you so much, he wants to prepare you. He wants you to be ready for what he has in store later on. I tell you, he is the ultimate chess player. He is the master chess. He's a chess master of all masters. Because he has, he knows what he, he's called you for. He's made you to be here for. And are there obstacles along the way? Yes. But you are prepared or being prepared to do that if you will follow the path, if you will follow him. Everything they did is about following him. He said, follow me. He didn't say, I want you to go by the self-help guide. Right. I don't, I've got 12, step, 12 steps here to get you to this place over here. Or I have a seven-part in-depth teaching on how to get from here to here. Now, hear my heart. I'm not bashing anybody. I'm saying, he said, follow me. Yeah. Very simple. Yeah. Not hard. The things that seemed important to them before weren't quite so important anymore. What was becoming the most important thing was listening to Jesus teach. Hearing his words. And not only hearing them, but living them. Yes. And observing them. Yes. What, what, were they, what were they doing? Wherever the Spirit led, they followed. Yeah. 
because he followed only what he heard his father say, only what his father did. So that's, there's a there's a bless you. There's a very simple lesson in that. It's not hard. Are you following him, or are you following someone else? Because listen, charismatic teachers are a dime a dozen. You turn on Facebook and there's 50 people out there wanting to show their face. I mean, you can't turn on a. I really don't like Facebook. Just being honest. We, we advertise on it. I just, I mean, everyone wants to be heard now. There's a platform now for people to talk. All the, I mean, you can't turn it on without seeing video after eight people recording themselves. <laughs> people showing themselves studying. People doing all these things because, you know what, it's not glorifying Him. It's showing how holy they are. Because people think so much about what they have to say that it's more important than what He has to say. And, 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 and hear, hear, my, hear my heart on this. There's some good teaching on there, but there is some bad teaching in, on there. And they mix just enough truth with just enough other stuff to get into arguments with people and cause you to get off the track, which is just to follow Him. Amen. So how do you weed it out? The good, the bad, the ugly, right? What I say is turn it off and get in the Word. Amen. <laughs> And then you know what? We, you have a, you're supposed to have a church home, a church body. That's where you go. And then God promotes you. He goes, well, you know what? He goes, you're good at that. I want to make you a teacher. So then you start teaching, right? Or you're good at that. I'm calling you to evangelism. Or you're, I'm calling you to the prophetic. I'm calling you. And that's how you do it. It's not about how many people watch you. Or how many likes you get. You know, I, I almost get embarrassed seeing myself on there sometimes. And then I realized the Lord has asked us to do something specific. Yes. And so you can ask Rebecca. She starts, she looks on there and watches for what I'm wearing and the color clash in the background and <laughs> things like that. And it, honestly, I don't like to hear myself. You know what I'm talking about. So you have to ask yourself, why am I doing that? Why do I want to be seen? Why do I want to be heard? Instead of why am I not just following him and going from there? It's it, right? right? Is that a legitimate question? Yeah. Yeah. We glorify Him, not ourselves. Yes. Yes. And if you're, if you're a skin presser, if you're one of those people that need to go out and meet everybody and talk to everyone, you want them to see your face, you want them to hear your name, you want them to be remembered, when you, you know what I mean? That you have to watch it. You, you have one foot on each side, and you're about to fall into one side. I would say be careful on that. Yeah. If it's not about Him, it's about you. They followed Jesus wherever the Spirit led. And you know what they did? They became more and more convinced that Jesus was exactly who He said He was. The Son of God. The Messiah. And they might not have understood exactly what that meant, or what that entailed, or what dimensions it would take that they would go through, but they came to believe that more than anything else in the world. Think about that. And all through the Gospels were shown Peter. Remember Peter? Good old Peter. Peter who assumes that Jesus needs the perfect, best, smartest, bravest, larger than knife, super disciple. And you know what? He works hard to make himself that. Peter's always the one that asks the big questions. You know, he, he, gets, he gets to ask those. He makes those confident declarations and brash decisions and even tries to protect Jesus with a sword. Right? Van Gogh had nothing on that. But let me ask you this. Just like Peter, have you ever tried to put on your best show for Jesus? Come on, think about that. The bravado. I'm a super Christian. Got a big C on my chest, you know. I mean, come on, let's be honest with each other. Amen. The promises we made to Jesus that we couldn't keep, that we didn't keep. Oh, I've done that a million times. 
Jesus, if you get me out of this, I'll never do this again. <laughs> Two hours later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and like I say, you have to be honest with yourself. Right. You have to be honest. Or we gave people the right answers, which we knew were wrong or were wrong from the beginning, mm -hmm. just to have them feel better about their, themselves or to make them happy. So we didn't make them mad. Or the brave face that we put on when we were really scared. Mm -hmm. yeah. Remember, I, my, my mom used to tell me, oh, you got to be brave. You can't be afraid. I was scared to death. My brother-in-law told me, you, listen, you have to be brave for this. I'm like, okay, I'm not scared as we walk into the haunted house, you know. <laughs> whole time my face is in her back. <laughs> as a kid. Yeah. But as we got older, going into combat in Iraq, scared to death. As a 19-year-old squad leader with five soldiers older than me, looking, trying to look brave. Eventually, truth comes out, doesn't it? Yes. We are scared. We are timid. We are all of those things. You know, we're the promises that we couldn't keep. The truth comes out that I, I just. I love you, Jesus. I just can't seem to stop. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do this. And so what happens to Peter, under pressure, he lies to protect himself. Overcome by fear, you know, it leads him to, to a place he never wanted to go. A place he never dreamed in a million years he would go. He went. John 13, 33 through 38. Let me read that. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered. And I could just see Jesus looking right at him, looking in his eyes, going, will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me. How many times? Three. Not once. Not twice. But three times. For somebody that says, I love you, I will do anything in this world for you. Oh, I messed up. Oh, what? Messed up again. I really love you. There's three times. So think about that. Peter failed Jesus. And so Peter, at this point, is buried in shame. Embarrassed that he isn't who he wants to be. And who he thinks others want him to be. Have you ever been in that position? You're embarrassed. You are not who others think you should be. Much less who you think you should be. I'm better than this. I shouldn't be doing this. I shouldn't be doing it again and again and again. And he did it to Jesus. And this kind of becomes a tomb for Peter. You know? He failed, and everyone knew it, especially Jesus. Think about having that on your mind. Ah, I failed in front of everybody. I failed. But then you know Jesus, because you know what? Jesus even, he looked eye to eye with Jesus the third time the cock crowed. Think about that. How could he go on? He proved himself to be a sham. Man, how, how dejected, how, you know, he had to just be at the, the bottom of the bottom. And so that's where we're kind of going to pick up right now is Peter, even though Jesus had already appeared to the disciples and to Peter twice, Peter is broken and crushed at this point. Nothing mattered anymore. Life lost its luster. Have you ever felt like that? I'm down. I'm, I'm out. I don't, I, don't, I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. I'm not going to clean up today. It's, what, what, what's the use? 
I don't even want to eat today. I, I'm sick of eating. I'm, everything has lost its luster. Everything is just, yeah, it's the same old thing. I'm tired of this. I'm sick of this. So that's where Peter was. Have you ever failed the Lord so miserably that you thought to yourself, how could you ever forgive me? Been there. I am beyond repair. I, I am so broken. I, you will never have another thing to do with me. Have you been there? Yeah. Even though people tell you over and over, Jesus forgives you. You just, you don't want to hear it. You just, I just, I don't, I don't want to hear it. I had a choice. I, 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 not just three times. How about 30 times? But you still can't forgive yourself. And that's what it comes down to. You're hanging on to your failure. You're hanging on to your failures. You cannot forgive yourself for those things. And you'll say, oh yeah, I'm forgiving myself. But that crud, poison is still inside of you so deep. It only comes out in the angriest moments. It's not, it's not healed. It's still in there. We've all felt at certain times like we've just disqualified ourselves. And here's what I want to tell you. Jesus has never disqualified you. Amen. It's because of Him that you're qualified. Amen. Not because of you. Not because of what you didn't do. It's because of what He did. That's the qualification. You just have to understand. You're not so broken that He will never love you. That's not true. That would go against everything of who He is. And who he, he is is love, pure love. So I'm pretty sure that's what Peter was feeling when he decided to go back to the same thing he had left behind three years earlier. He went back to his old life. He was lost, confused, fell back into his old ways of doing things Fishing for fish, not for people. Hmm. Isn't that how it is sometimes when we, you know, we, we get saved and we're so on fire and then something in our life blows up and we go back to our old lifestyle. We go back to our old life. Hmm. We had a real radical transforming life experience with Jesus and we return to what had our attention, our love, a long time ago. We go back to our comfort spot, that corner we would crawl into, go back to the bars, go back to whatever it was we were doing, whoever it was we were seeing, just because that was comfortable. Yeah, I did the Jesus thing, and I blew it. But you know what? When we met Christ, when we really met Christ, we became new creations, new creatures, right? Everything was made new. Yes. Here's the thing. I hear people say, you know what? You don't, have to, you don't have to think about it. Just do it. Just do good. You don't have to think about it. Well, that's not true. Our, we have to line up our mind, will, and emotions. Our spirit is saved, right? And completely encapsulated and sealed. But you know what? Our mind has to be renewed because, you know what? You have to think about it. So I, I, I hate when I hear people say that. You just, if you're just doing it, you're doing the actions, you know, so what? I mean, the, the best, kindest people on earth aren't going to make it to heaven if they don't know Jesus Christ. Right. He's the only way to heaven. Amen. So actions aren't going to get you there. Sometimes we fail Jesus, but Jesus never fails us. Jesus never gives up on us, no matter what, because He is love, pure and undefiled love, unconditional love that never gives up. Love never fails, right? 1 Corinthians 13, right? Is the word true? Yes. Completely? Yes. What about just part of it? Completely, 100%. And that's what you have to understand. That's our foundation that we step on, that we build on, that we walk on, we create on, is that foundation. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone of that foundation in the Word. 
Jesus is love made flesh. So, John 21, Peter and the disciples are out in a fishing boat, not having very much success at the time, and Jesus is watching from the shore. <laughs> they return to their old ways, but guess what? Jesus had not left them. And Jesus does what He always does. He called out to them. And so often the case for us, He calls out to us, but the disciples, us, we just don't realize that it was Jesus. We think it's our mind. We think it's, you know, oh, that can't be right. I'm here in this office building, and it's, it can't be Him asking me to go do that. That's, you know, Jesus calls out. He calls out to us all. Are we hearing it? I wonder how many times He calls out to us, and we just don't even know it's Him. He called out to the disciples who were in the boat, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. Now remember, these are professional, <laughs> professional fishing men who are about to get their own series on cable television. And they never catch a single fish without Jesus. Every time we hear about that, they haven't caught a thing. Not a perch, not a minnow. And now they're back, reclaiming what they left behind until Jesus shows up and turns their, li their life on its ear again. He comes back to him, and this time it's Jesus Christ cooking breakfast. Think about that. He's providing them with a meal. That's amazing to me. I read that and I thought, look, that, look, that was him cooking. He was grilling. It's not Darren this time. It was Jesus. He was he was grilling. <laughs> so Jesus asked Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? More than these. Think about that. Ask Jesus asking, do you love me more than these? More than the nets? More than fear and doubt? More than broken ego? More than the old ways of doing things? And Jesus asked him how many times? Three times. Asked him three times. You know, Peter says, and again he says, you know... And in desperation, Peter says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And with those words, a light came on. A light came on. And Peter realizes just how much he really does love the Lord. Despite his own failures. Despite everything he did wrong. Despite it all. Peter, a mere human, a failure, can love the Lord with all his heart. Peter is reconciled to God when he realizes just how much God loves him and just how much he loves God. And see, that's, that's what's missing today in our world. People don't realize just how much God loves them. They think they've been taught these things where he's just going to destroy. He's going to send a hurricane to your vacation home in Florida if you don't act right. If you don't say your prayers every day, you're not covered. And you're going to be... You're going to have this happen and this happen. And I hear people say that all the time. Who did We, we heard someone the other day, uh, uh, a pastor, wasn't it? Saying something like that. And I was like, wait, wait. It's just, it hits you right in the gut when you hear that. Because that's not his character. That's not his true nature. That's not who God is. No matter what you've done, God can and will forgive you. You know, and all you have to do is get in that relationship with him and say, all right, here it is, Lord. But you can't give if you don't let go. If you if you got a death grip on whatever it is and you don't let go, it's, you, no one can take that from you. God's not going to override your will. But as soon as you say, Lord, I can't do this anymore. Oh, cue the angels. It is like nothing I've ever felt in my life up to that point. Are you willing to accept forgiveness for yourself? And be set free to really live, to really, really live. I mean, to live without that, that baggage, those things that are weighing you down. You know, stuff, you know, it's, it's not fake it till you make it. That's not what it's about. Because you'll, you'll get tired of that. You'll wear out on that. I mean, I, Rebecca and I can tell you, I don't know how many churches we've been in in our lives combined, but it was always fake it till you make it. 
you know, smile, shake hands, you know, oh, praise the Lord, hallelujah. You go home and you're just as miserable as you was before you left. That's not a life-changing experience. That's not relationship. That's appearances. And that's what the world is so big on. That's what the world is so big on. The administrator of the largest psychiatric hospital in London once was quoted as saying, if the people here only knew what it means to be forgiven, I could dismiss half of them at once. Guilt, shame, condemnation, all diagnosed as mental disease, which I'm telling you, if you, you live in that circumstance long enough, you will have all kinds of things. There's an open door there. You're allowing things, you know, those things to just to become who you are as opposed to who you really are in Christ. Think about that. Jesus knew everything about Peter. Everything was laid open to see. Peter was not a super disciple. He was not perfect. He was just a person, a faulty, imperfect person like everyone else. And that's a humbling experience. The disciples were like all of us. I mean, they were just, just people, average people. Same problems, same issues, but they chose to follow him. You know what humility is? Humility consists in being precisely the person you actually are before God. Yes. Do I need to say that again? Yes. Yeah. Humility consists in being precisely the person you actually are before God. Not pretending to be someone in front of God. Every time you go pray, you know, you're like, oh, I'm get my hair straight. You know, get down and, okay. God, it's not, God sees you. He knows you inside and out. Being, humility is being who you are. Blemishes and all. Amen. Dirt, all that stuff. Just going in front of Him saying, this is who I am, Lord. I need help in these areas. I need help here. I need help here. You know what? And He's so willing to help you and pick you up. And, yes. and, and, and yes. you know, Rebecca had a, a dream once or a vision where she, and she walked in all dirty in front of Him and He blew on her and it blew away all the dirt and there was this shining armor underneath. But being who you precisely are in front of God, that's humility. Not pretending. Because if you're going to pretend in front of Him, you're going to pretend in front of everybody. Come on, that's right. I don't want that. We don't want that. It's being the person we actually are, not hiding behind the pretty painted picture of who we pretend to be. And not buried in the tomb of shame, who we are not. Honest, free failures right here in the open. <laughs> now, I'm going to get into that real quick before I, before I end here. Failures. In just my opinion, this is why it was the perfect time for Jesus to invite Peter, yet again, to join him in the work of the Good Shepherd in this moment. Because he was at his rock bottom again. It wasn't the bravado Peter that Jesus was asking to do this work. Nor is it the bravado Peter who was responding. This is a different Peter. The first Peter would have been a terrible shepherd. The first you would be a terrible shepherd. The first me would have been a terrible shepherd. It takes that transition of following Him, learning from Him, watching Him, hearing from Him, to where we actually become a shepherd, a good shepherd. You ever hear Him called the good shepherd? Because there's some bad shepherds. He's a good shepherd. And a good shepherd is one that doesn't clamor to be the best or the most watched or the most seen or the most admired. A good shepherd is about the sheep. Amen. But this Peter, the real, humble, loved, forgiven, joyful Peter, will make an excellent shepherd. And that's who you are. That's who we are. 
You're forgiven. Start acting like it. Yes. Walk that walk. You don't need to lower your head and walk in shame. You have that relationship with Jesus. You're forgiven. It's done. It's over. God doesn't remember it. Why should you? Amen. Start acting like it. Get over it. Get over it. He's saying to you, feed my lambs. Take care of my sheep. Feed my sheep. Whatever aspect you're called to, whichever part of that you're called to, just do it. Let's just get up and go. I could be in home right now in bed, laying on my back, feeling sorry for myself. That's not what God called me to do. That's not who I am. That's not who you are. And please understand this. If there are times you have, listen, I, yeah, I was in there all week just about. But I spent time with him. I spent time just being thankful for him. I have a wife that's got one of those uh, sheep rods that she was hitting me with. Come on, get up. You know, you're <laughs> But you know what? You're called. You have a role. You have a place in the kingdom. And that's what we want to help you find out. What's your place? All this good teaching you have, good training you have, it's not wasted. Amen. It's not wasted. Let's put it to work together. Amen. And here's the thing, it's hard work. Yes, yes. Doing this is hard work. Mm -hmm. And guess what? It'll take all your efforts the rest of your lives to do what He's asked you to do. And I honor that. I accept that. Do you? Or are you waiting for one that you don't have to do anything? You can sit back. You can spend 10 minutes on the task. It's done. It's over. I'm so glad that's over with. I've been in jobs like that. That is not what the calling in the kingdom is. It is something you will have a grace you've never understood before. You will have provision just waiting there for you. He will have people who he's called to do that. They still have a choice. As they're walking through this with you, they still have a choice. Am I going to be all into the kingdom or am I, am I going to fall back a little to flesh? And it's, it's a walk. It's where you walk together. And we're all learning. And no one's perfect. But we're, we can figure it out as we go forward just by following Jesus. Following Jesus. You are really going to go through a lot of things. Do you understand that? Yes. The world might even hate you because of it. Amen. You may die because of it. Yeah. But if you love me, you can't just fish for fish anymore. <laughs> His calling will be for the kingdom. It won't be for you. It won't be for materialistic things. It won't be for any of those things. It'll be for the kingdom. And are you willing to do this? What I want you to ask you, I want you to pray about it. I want you to, to understand that the Lord has asked you to be on this planet for a reason. Are you ready to follow Him wherever that takes? One of the visions I had, the open visions, was walking into this dark storm, horrendous dark purple storm. And my hand was up being held, and I looked, and it was Jesus holding my hand. And we were walking right into that storm, and his face was, you know, they say it's set like flint. I never really understood what that meant, but when I saw his face just set on that, and I was holding his hand, and we were going for that, and I looked back, and I saw everybody walking behind us, just going right into this. I knew at that point, and we had some good conversations about that, about what we were walking into. Cheerfully. Happily, which you know, you're thinking, how could you be, you know, I'm telling you that grace, that that's the kingdom, that's doing it, that's taking it to them. So, follow me. Think about those two words, follow me. That's, all, that's what he said, follow me. God has called us all to be part of the greatest journey imaginable. So, why be quiet about that? Ask your friends. Ask your neighbors. Hey, come join us. You know, Sanctuary, uh, Crowned One Ministries. Hey, come on. There's something brewing here. We're figuring this thing out as we go. We, we've got a good vision. The Lord has given us a good vision. We want you to be a part of it. And you know what? People will stay away by the thousands. 
Your car's like, ah, oh, that sounds, I don't know. That's a little extreme. You know, oh, wait, 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 wait. You mean I can't choose to have an abortion? No, 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 you're one of those crazies. How did that get reversed? It's, it's about life. Just your neighbor. Think about who lives, who lives next to you. Are they dying and going to hell? Are they saved? Do they know the truth? Do they know the gospel truth? Well, you know what? It's probably your responsibility to go next door and say, hey, I just, I'm not going to cram anything down your throat. Just want to say, hey, would you like to come to church with us one day? And then that's it. Like I say, I call that a hit and run. Then you leave. And they're like, what are, they asking that? what are they talking about? Maybe they might show up. Or maybe they might ring your doorbell and say, what are you talking about? What do y'all, you know, get a little more. But seed is planted. And you let the Holy Spirit run with that. I want to ask you something real quick. Do you know what it means to be loved and forgiven? By your parents? By your kids? Well, listen, we have a Father. We have a Holy Spirit. We have a Comforter. And you know what we do? We give those things to the Lord. And we don't wear ourselves out <coughs> trying to make it right. And all you do is make it worse. But we get to, listen, we can link arms with you on that. We can pray with you on that. We can all, we can bombard them with prayer and speaking life and speaking forgiveness into those relationships with you. So that, I'm telling you, there's reconciliation in all of our lives, in all of our families. Failure. Following Christ is a total commitment. There will be times when you fail. Don't hold yourself to an unrealistic standard. Yes. You will fail at times. But what matters is if you get up right. and continue to go. Failure should be our teacher, not our undertaker. That's good. That's right. yeah. Amen. Failure is a delay, not a defeat. In Jesus' eyes, our failure is a temporary detour, not a dead end street. David, Israel's greatest king, a man after God's own heart, failed. Moses, giant among Israelites, giver of the law, deliverer of the people, failed. Jacob, father of Israel, failed. Isaac, son of promise, failed. Abraham, patriarch of Israel, father of the faithful, prototype of those who are called righteous through faith, failed. Even our first parents, Adam and Eve, in their human perfection, failed. Paul failed. Peter failed. Every one of the twelve apostles failed. Who hasn't failed other than Jesus? We all fail. And you're going to stop holding yourself up to some religious status you can't reach. It's not possible. It'll never be possible. But we're on the right path. We are going that way. We are following Him. And if we slip, trip, and fall, we get back up, someone right there next to you goes, come on, I got you. We got this. Let's keep going. Yeah. That's what it's all about. The, the fight is taking the fight to them to continue, not rolling around on the ground waiting for the next attack to take you out. Amen. Will we follow Him despite ourselves? Because here's the thing is you get in your own way. I get in my own way. We're following Him. It's up here where the battle is being waged mostly. We get in our own way. Ah, uh, you know what? I'm not going to church today. Uh, I just really don't feel good. You know, I'm feeling, you know. And, and please, I'm not picking on anybody. I'm saying the opportunity is always there to learn, to hear something. You may not like the whole message, but there's something in there just for you that the Holy Spirit has said, uh-huh. That's for you. That's right. That's right. Yes. Better like the whole message. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Listen, guys, it just, it, and Shelly, if you wouldn't mind coming up. It, it all boils down to we've all failed many times. You may not remember this, and some of you might because you're still that young. When you tried to walk for the first time, you fell down. First time you swam, you might have almost drowned. You know, first time you played baseball, you didn't hit the ball first time. Probably, maybe, probably not. We've all failed in certain ways, but the thing is we have to keep going. The, the heavy hitters, the ones who hit the most home runs in baseball were also the strikeout kings. Babe Ruth was the strikeout king. And he had the home run record for years and years and years. Don't look at it through religious eyes. Look at it through the journey. It's a journey that we all get to walk once he says, follow me, and we follow him. I'm so proud to be able to walk through this with my beautiful wife, great friends, people that the Lord has called, all of you. I'm so thankful for each and every one of you. And just, Rebecca and I were talking about this the other day. We're so proud of all of you. You know, Justin, you know, Justin has come so far since the day I met him. And he has some stumbles. We all do. But the thing is, we got to keep going. Get back up and pick up where we left off. I'm not picking on Justin. I'm saying just as examples. We have all been places where, you know what, we're thinking, oh, I messed up. But then just one second later, like, but. <laughs> God. Jesus, what he did. And we are, he, listen, he's asking us to carry the banner. He's asking us all to do it. Are you in this with us? Are you with us? Yes. Fish for people. Serve humbly. Not about you. Not about how much you can be heard or how many people you see and shake hands with. It's not about that. It's about Jesus, about following Him. One day in heaven, there's going to be a corner, and we're all going to be gathered there. We're going to, believers who have suffered, who have failed Christ, who've denied Christ at some point in their lives, but ultimately found a relationship with Him, and we're all going to be there together. You know, and I can just see right now, I can see Beck talking to Jesus about how there needs to be more trees. And we'll all be sitting there gathered on a porch, some of us drinking coffee. And some of us will be looking off in the distance and we're going to see someone. And they're bent over a fire and they're grilling fish. He's going to say, come join me. Come join me. Come have breakfast. We'll know who it is. It's one that always comes and always calls to us and always says, let's do this. Let's, let's, let's eat together. Let's be together. Let's, let's talk together. Let's walk together. But right now we get to walk this out arm in arm together. <laughs>